Let's get more now on the pilots. They are the focus of the investigators right now, and ABC's Bob Woodruff is covering that angle from Kuala Lumpur. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, George. This is the prayer wall here at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport. It was nine days ago today when Flight 370 took off from here. That mystery continues to unfold, and the investigation is intensifying. This morning, video posted many times on YouTube but has yet to be authenticated appears to show the pilot of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 going through airport security. The Malaysian authorities are refocusing the investigations on all crew and passengers on board MH370. Over the weekend, investigators combed through 53-year-old pilot Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah's home, confiscating two laptops and his home flight simulator. Seen here in this YouTube video he posted. When I asked Peter Chong, a close friend of the captain, about the flight simulator, he said Shah was a tech geek who simply loved to fly. To be able to, to, to buy things off the, the counter and set up his own uh, flight simulator, yeah, and uh, it's something he's proud of. In terms of politics, Zahari is a member of the opposition party in Malaysia, whose party leader, Anwar Ibrahim, was jailed the very same day of the flight, March 7th. Chong says that despite Zahari's T-shirt here declaring democracy is dead, the pilot is not an extremist. 57-year-old Chris Nissen from Oregon has known Shaw for over 18 years and says there's no way he was involved. I cannot imagine him doing anything to hurt himself, the passengers, the property. It really hurts when people would even suggest something like that. Investigators are also looking into the co-pilot, 27-year-old Fariq Abdul Hamid, who, according to Channel 9, Australia's A Current Affair, invited these women into the cockpit back in 2011, allegedly taking pictures and smoking cigarettes with the women during the flight. Meanwhile, families of passengers like American Philip Wood are not giving up hope. We were raised to have a deep Christian faith, and we're, we're relying on that right now real heavily. Now back here at the airport on this wall you can see there are more prayers and hopes and words every single day. It's growing about 30 yards long. Some of them are handmade. Others are by people that come in and sign. In fact this one is for the co-pilot Farik. All of these hopes and these prayers are for every single person on that plane. George. A lot of heartache over there. Okay, Bob, thank you. Our aviation consultant, Steve Gannier, joins us now. And Steve, let's walk through this brand new information we're getting today. First off, well, we now know it was the co-pilot who spoke the last words. What does that tell us? George, the timeline's been muddied a bit about when these actions have been taken in the cockpit, but all the facts that we've been talking about, all the premeditated actions, the, the change in course, the A cars, turning off the transponder, all these premeditated actions still stand. It's still very interesting that the co-pilot did this. We're trying to figure out who is the more likely suspect here if it is the two crew members. And for the, for the co-pilot to say something, they'll go back and they'll look at the voices and they'll look for stress in his voice to see, did somebody have a gun in his head? Was he being told to do something? Uh, but again, lots of little clues, but we're still not there yet. And, and you add to that, at least the Malaysian Airlines officials are saying that the two pilots did not request to fly together. Right. So, so you can't say that they were that they were conspirators, and and finding any link between the uh, the pilot and the co-pilot so far has been fruitless. Uh, meantime, they are looking at that flight simulator. What could that conceivably tell us? Well, a flight simulator has a has a computer hard drive on it, so you could go back and you could do some computer forensics, and you can look at. Perhaps the pilot had pre-programmed some of these routes into that simulator. Maybe he had, he had test flown uh, a, a route if he was, uh, in fact, uh, responsible for this. So they'll just go back and do some, some standard computer forensics on that hard drive. And on the search now, it appears that the Malaysians have been catching up what we've been thinking for the last few days, that the focus really is on the south, not that northern land route. Yeah, so now, that, now as our sources have been telling us for a couple days now, we will shift down towards the south. You see that the Australians are now being, uh, are now responsible for that part of the search. But I think that we need to be careful here, George, because we're getting into that part of a mishap investigation where the facts, I think, are going to kind of continue to, to come to a, a halt, if not just uh, to a trickle. Uh, so the facts, the science, we're not going to get too much more out of the satellites. Uh, they're going to have to do some on-the-ground forensics, but we've got to be careful that we don't do too much speculation. Uh, as we continue to look for the wreckage of that airplane. Yeah, we have a lot more to learn. Okay, Steve, thanks very much.